Godzilla is now in New York City. Monster Zero One and Zero Two, commence the attack. to stomp this way today we are reviewing gorath a 1962 japanese science fiction movie that does briefly have a giant monster very briefly baby how's everybody doing today good or it's, an, it's another day above ground it is another day above ground <clears throat> we're back to normal oklahoma weather kind of kind yeah, of it's been in the 70s the last couple of days well it was like 70 70- for like two days, yeah. and today it was like 50, 55. Yeah, so, all right, so yeah, we watched Gorath, or if you want to go by the original Japanese title, Suspicious Star Gorath. French title, Clash of the Planets. Or Clash the, of the Titans? <laughs> or the German title, UFOs Destroy the Earth. Or the alternate American title, Armageddon. <laughs> actually you know I actually did a little bit of extra homework for this movie because if you read the synopsis of this movie my first thought was this is the Japanese version of When Worlds Collide which is a 1951 American sci-fi movie about worlds colliding <laughs> <laughs> no way yeah so I actually I had seen it before a long time ago but I wanted to refresh my memory so I rented it on YouTube and rewatched it the other day because I wanted to compare and contrast these movies just to see how similar they were, and we may go through some of the similarities as the as we talk through the plot of the movie. But I will say they weren't as similar as I was afraid they were going to be. <laughs> but anyway, some quick making of trivia: this was not going to include a monster, but Tomoyuki Tanaka insisted on it, and Maguma, as the monster is called was going to be reptilian but honda did not want to do a rehash of godzilla so it was a giant walrus instead <laughs> honda has said that if it was not for maguma being in the movie it would probably be his favorite film that he made hmm. honda pushed for realism but tanaka told him not to be concerned about such things <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that yeah. yeah tanaka just wanted a sci-fi spectacle he didn't care how much sense it made or didn't make original japanese cut has never had an, or- an official release outside of japan so we watched it on a a bootleg quote unquote a high quality bootleg i think they just took the japanese dvd and just copied it over to this dvd and added subtitles the English version was heavily edited, and the scene with Maguma was removed. So, there you go. <laughs> and this film takes place from 1976, when the film opened, through the year 1982. So, it takes place over a period of six years. Fancy. is one of the, the first major differences between it and When Worlds Collide. When Worlds Collide took place over about a period of eight months. So, yeah. Anyway. This film was released on March 21st of 1962 and had a budget of around 126 million yen. So, not bad. Anyway, we're going to listen to the trailer. We're going to come back, read off the cast and crew, read off a plot summary, and then we'll talk about Gorath. See you in a bit. こちら JX2 
全世界の科学者を動員して南極基地に展開するグラス対策陣の一大攻防戦なるかいけませんわそんな河野先生に言わしてもらいます今度だけ私の意見に従ってくださいもしものことがあれば国連が責任を持つもしものことがあってから責任を持ったって何になるんです人類は滅亡するかもしれないんですよいそのことゴラスが地球ぶつかってみんな死んじまった方が幸せかもしれないんだ太陽系に侵入すれば45日目に地球に到達しますぜ作費3億8千万東方が世界に誇る宇宙科学人と特集撮影を駆使して雄大なスケールで描く超スペクタクル巨演「妖精グラス」「妖精グラス」「ここに堂々完成」All right, we're back. Are we? Yes, we are. Dang it. We got some familiar faces in the cast and crew. Oh, that's here right. I've never heard of any of these names. Directed <clears throat> by Ishiro Honda, written by Takashi Kimura, music by Kan Ishii, not by Kira Fukube, oddly enough, although it does sound very reminiscent at times. Or that other guy, Masaru Sato. Masaru Sato, yeah. Effects yeah. by Eiji Tsuburaya. And starring every major actor that Toho had on their payroll at the time. Oh, uh-uh, no way. <laughs> Which includes Ryo Ikebe, Yumi Shirakawa, Akira Kubo, Kumi Mizuno, Hiroshi Tachikawa, Akihiko Hirata, Kenji Sahara, Jun Tazaki, Ken Uruhara, and Takashi Shimura. What? Via. By plot. <laughs> Not my plot. It's plot. Yeah. More or less. <laughs> After it is discovered that a giant star dubbed Gorath is heading towards Earth, a Japanese spacecraft is sent to gather data. The ship is destroyed, but enough data is gathered to confirm that the celestial body will collide with Earth. In the wake of this discovery, the governments of the world unite to build giant rocket engines in the South Pole that will push Earth out of the path of the oncoming star. Though the plan hits several snags, including the cave-in, a giant walrus attack, and Gorath growing in size, It is successful in the end, and Earth is saved from Armageddon. <laughs> in the final scene, the scientists promise to return Earth to its normal orbit as credits roll. More or less. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, so, like I said, I watched When Worlds Collide, because if you just read the plot synopsis, they sound very similar. And the basic plots are the same, you know. Both are about a giant planet heading towards Earth to, you know, collide with it and destroy it. But I was actually surprised. I was glad they aren't. It isn't a copy and paste plot of When Worlds Collide. You know, it actually takes When Worlds Collide. They don't actually get a rocket into space until like the last five minutes of the movie. <laughs> so here, this movie actually, we start on Earth. We see Kumi Mizuno and the other main actress in this film in a car going to the beach or something, and they see a rocket a rocket ship take off and then we spend most of the first i want like 20 minutes of this movie in space and we see this crew captained by jun tazaki i believe <clears throat> they were supposed to go visit saturn but they were diverted to, to go, go check out the star planet thingy. Gorath. i will say you know it is told like at the very beginning that this mission is supposed to take nine months or whatever The way it's edited together, it feels like it's all happening in real time. So, you know, maybe you yeah. could work on their editing skills a little bit, but yeah. whatever. But, but you know, I like this first sequence. I, I like, you know, I mean, it's pretty sci- classic sci-fi-ish, you know, mysterious mission to go explore this threat heading towards Earth. I think actually Jun, Jun Tazaki is really good in this, in this opening bit. You can see his emotions coming through when, you know, he has to tell his crew that, That they're all going to die. They're all going to die. Yeah. And the crew, but they handle it very, very stoically and they complete their mission and send the data back to Earth. Also, I guess the other actress is it Yumi Shirakawa. Probably. Her uh, father was played by Jun Tazaki and he's dead. And also Kumi Mizuno's boyfriend was like the first <clears throat> mate or whatever. 
And he's dead also, obviously. So then we come back to Earth for, you know, the rest of this plot. And essentially, you know, they, uh, you know, they spend a lot of this, the next, you know, act of this movie, you know, in UN rooms and talking about what they're going to do. Meetings and, you know, talking yeah. about what they're going to do and all this. You know, the main character, I, the, the top build character. There's not really a main character in this movie. This play, this movie's got a lot of characters doing a lot of different things. But I think it's Ryo Ikebe. He's like the scientist, like kind of spearheading. Yeah, and and you know it's. I mean, you know, again, it's it's one of those Japanese movies where there's not really a main character. There's a lot of a lot of different characters doing a lot of different things. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time, like I said, in boardrooms and stuff. It's not enthralling. No. <laughs> but it's not dreadfully boring either. I mean, there's like a sequence where the Akira Kubo is like this um, aspiring <clears throat> space pilot. Or as astronaut, I guess, <laughs> and they like hijack a helicopter and take it for a spin and take it to the like the headquarters of the operation to <laughs> beg for you know they get to go on this mission and they're not arrested for some reason. There's a scene where Kira Kubo goes because he's crushing on Kumi Mizuno's character and he goes up to her apartment, and gives her a present, gives her a present, but then he finds the picture of her dead boyfriend and she's still, I guess, you know. Morning is lost. So he gets all pissed off about it, walks over and chunks his picture out the, off the balcony. I'm like, I would never speak to him again. <laughs> but she handles it like a champ. I don't know. There's some other stuff that and goes And then she on. seems super excited the rest of the movie every time he shows up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Kimmy Mizuno, like, totally disappears for, like, the middle part of this movie once, you know, Gorya starts getting closer. I don't know, you know, they start to build these... They decide that the mm-hmm. best way to save Earth is to build these giant rocket engines into the South Pole to move the Earth 400,000 kilometers out of the way. Mm-mm. I mean, I'm not really sure on the science behind that. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Sure. <laughs> that doesn't seem logistically, even beginning to be logistically possible. I mean, I'm not a scientist. Mm-hmm. I'm not a scientist, so if there are any scientists out there, maybe you can mm-hmm. email us and explain yeah. us the science behind that. <laughs> but it just doesn't seem logistically possible. doesn't seem quite right, No. And they also send a second mission to Gorath. I don't really remember why. I guess to gather more information on it. And this one's, you know, got a Kirikubo and a Akihiko Harata and a bunch of famous people on it. And uh, See, here's my question: If they were gonna send something to sp- send someone else to space, why didn't they go the Armageddon route? I mean, obviously they, they hadn't seen Armageddon. This is the, the what uh, the thirty almost four seven years, years before that movie came out. <laughs> yeah. Why didn't they just send someone up there to like blow it up? Well, I think. It's supposed to be a star, right? So I'm mm-hmm. and it looks. I think the surface is way. T- for one, the surface would probably be way too hot. And two, they keep talking over and over again about how it's got six thousand. Even though it's but they, only, yeah, but they say they say it's a star, or it's it's described as a star in in like the synopsis or whatever. Yeah. But they keep referring to it as a planet in the movie. Do they? Yeah. I thought they always referred to it. No, as a they star. refer to it as a planet almost the entire movie. Are you sure? Pretty sure I heard uh, them refer to it as a planet almost. Most, well, you didn't hear it. You read it. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I thought I don't they said speak Japanese. Refer so. to as star, but regardless, maybe they go back and forth. On they that, they keep talking about how it's you know six thousand times the mass of Earth, even though it's only three fourths the size of Earth, and how the gravity is six thousand times that of Earth. So even if they could, you know, even if it wasn't too hot to be on the surface. The gravity. Well, would I'm not saying this. So to go full Armageddon and like him. send people, <laughs> send people to step foot on it. Just, yeah. I mean, they're already taking creative liberties, mm-hmm. being the fact that this is mostly set, you know, like almost 20 years after the the time that it came out. They're yeah. taking creative liberties anyway. Why can't they just assume that this rocket can shoot? D- atomic bombs or something because that's not exciting it's much more exciting to build giant rocket engines into the south pole and move the is earth is it like a giant spaceship is it <laughs> it is is it because later something incredible is going to happen but anyway so yeah that mission happens at Kubo during the mission he suffers a traumatic experience he almost dies and he gets amnesia from it yeah. doesn't really play a huge part in the plot but uh, and then they have another spaceship that goes up there and gets him yeah, well, he was on the main spaceship, and then he went out on this little, like, shuttle thing, and then they oh, reeled him back sorry. in, yeah. Right. And then, yeah, so that happens, and then, yeah, so as it gets closer to Earth, you know, they they fire up these rocket engines, and because they, during the melting of the South Pole, I guess they free this giant walrus. I mean, they have a cave-in earlier, which causes issues, but yeah, then they free this giant walrus, which attacks giant Maguma. Walrus. 
And they just get in a helicopter and shoot it down. Well, it's not a helicopter. It's this little space. Oh, little yeah, it's a plane. Like a yeah. fighter jet thing. Uh, then, yeah, they shoot a laser at it and kill it. They try to bury it first because they don't want to kill it, but that doesn't work. So then they, they, they just shoot it and kill it. I think Magma is in the movie for all of about five minutes. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> and then... And it didn't even show up till an hour or more in the movie. An hour seven, I think, is when it showed up. And yeah. it's an 88-minute movie, an hour 28-minute movie. Um, and then, yeah, I think, obviously, the best part of this movie is when Gore Weather gets close enough to start affecting Earth, you know, it mm-hmm. like floods Japan or floods, parts of Japan. Yeah, yeah. flood it causes the giant flood, it dest- sucks in and destroys the moon. Mm-hmm. Uh, it actually, we see it, you know, suck in Saturn's rings first. Causes some earthquakes and stuff. Causes some yeah. massive earthquakes, causes a lot of avalanches and, and rock slides and... Cave-in stuff. caves in stuff. Caves in, things of that nature. Lots of destruction. But you know what? Their plan works, and it slides right past Earth, and they 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 survive. They live happily ever after. Yeah. yeah. Well, then they promise to return the Earth to its orbit, and yeah, credits roll essentially. Akira Kugo, he did come back to Earth, and Kumi Mizuno took him in, and, and, and after he his memory back. Yeah, you know, after he mm-hmm. saw Gorath on the TV, his memory came back. I guess. Yeah. Um, That's not what happened. Sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of time spent with. I say a lot. There's a there's a decent amount of time spent with Takashi Shimura and like his little family, like the granddaughter. Yeah. His granddaughter is the main female character, and her brother, I guess, which he you know just kind of always annoying everybody in the movie. And Kumi's and or she is crushing on the main scientist guy, Ryo Ikabe, and there's some service paid to that. And yeah. Yeah. But the characters really don't matter that much. So, yeah. That's yeah. essentially what the movie is. It's alright. It's not a bad movie. Uh, we've definitely watched a lot yeah. worse. Oh, yeah. yeah. I actually, you know, it's only 80, 88 minutes, obviously. I don't actually think the pacing, despite the fact that there's not a, a whole lot of interesting <laughs> characters, I don't think the pacing's that bad. I think they do enough to... Yeah, the pacing's actually not horrible. You know, we complain about a lot of the Showa-era Godzilla films and all their boardroom sequences and stuff. Mm-hmm. But nine times out of ten, those films, it's literally just boardroom sequences, and there's like no like interjections of anything kind of interesting happening. Yeah, it's mostly just like, oh no, Godzilla's coming. What do we got to do about Godzilla? Oh, we could do this. Oh, that won't work. Well, we could do this. We could do this, and someone starts spouting off some sort of some crap. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's a couple you know interjected scenes in between where some things are going on. Yeah, yeah. So it's all right. It's yeah. not bad. I think. Perfectly entertaining 60s sci-fi movie is the best way to explain it, I think. Anyway, you guys want to move on to creature design? Sure. (laughs) With the one creature. So we have Magma. Magma? Uh, Magma. Magma. M-A-G-U-M-A. Magma. Magma. He doesn't look Maguma. great. Maguma. Maguma. <laughs> he doesn't look great. Uh, he, he looks like a giant walrus. He looks like he a lies. guy in a walrus suit. Yeah. He's like a giant rubber walrus suit. Yeah. Basically what they're I going mean, for, though. <laughs> I think the fact that it's a walrus, you know. A, a walrus? walrus? <laughs> a walrus. A walrus. I mean, it kind of, like, makes sense because, you know, they're in this. I don't know if there's any walruses on the in Antarctica, but, you know, there's walruses in cold places and you know, whatever I guess. So you know, I, I whatever I guess. I'm not really important to the to the plot, really. Oh, it literally pertains none to the plot. Yeah, you could little... you could cut you could cut the walrus out, and it'd be the same movie. Which they did it for the American cut. They cut the walrus out. Tanaka just wanted it because they were on a giant monster kick at the time, and he thought it, it'd be good for marketing purposes. But you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think about? I mean. <laughs> The, the rocket ships and everything and the space stations you know they all look pretty they all look pretty, pretty yeah. decent pretty um, good pretty classic look typical like sci-fi pretty stuff pretty classic sci-fi yeah, early, yeah you know early mid 60s sci-fi rockets and stuff like that what do you think about Gorath looks like a star thing yeah, yeah looks like a red disco ball hidden for her <laughs> <laughs> but going into effects you know I think the model work is pretty good in this movie, all things considered. Yeah. I th- yeah, the model work's not bad. They do commit my ultimate atrocity yeah. with, with model work. Little people. Work. Little plastic people. Yeah. Your models look so much better when you don't have little tiny, inanimate, little plastic people that literally now, just are like... To be fair, some of these vehicles would look odd if they They would look odd if they didn't have little plastic people on them. Because you'd be like, well, what's moving that? But we have an extended sequence of the construction site of these rocket engines on the South Pole. 
I mean, it's a lot of moving parts. It's got to be a big oh, yeah. It's a big set. I will say, there is a lot of runtime padding in this movie where they like... like for They literally spend like five... There's probably a good five minutes of this movie mm-hmm. if just in this one like mm-hmm. sequence yeah. where mm-hmm. they like pan over and show you the entire thing mm-hmm. and then the collapse happens yeah. and then they pan back over as they're rebuilding it. Yeah. And there's a shot earlier when they hijack the helicopter. There's kind of a montage of them flying over things and singing songs. Yeah. So yeah, some good old fashioned runtime padding. But, but no, I think the model work is for the most part really good in this movie. I yeah. think all the space stuff looks pretty good. I mean, you can see the wires occasionally, but I mean, the zero gravity stuff kind of looks odd. There was a scene <laughs> where they're trying to pretend like they're running in zero gravity. And they're gravity. just going, we'll go. <laughs> it looks kind of odd. But when they're floating, I mean, again, you can see the wires on, on, on occasion, but it, it, it looks fine. Um, it's a bootleg copy of a movie from 1962. I, I will say the bootleg, mm. like I said, it, 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 it pretty much just looks like a normal DVD, though. It's yeah. not a bad yeah. bootleg copy. but um, It's not like some of the other. We have. Aaron has had to buy some bootlegs that are like. Bootlegs of bootlegs. Like bootlegs of a bootleg. <laughs> uh, like there's one movie we watched, uh, like someone filmed it with their own camera off of like a, like a, a boot- screen or something like yeah. that. And we watched one where it's just like a straight up copy of a VHS tape, yeah. like yeah. printed onto a DVD <laughs> disc. So, I mean. Can't complain. All things considered. Could be worse. And the yeah. subtitles. And it has the special features. The uh, yeah, that has special features. It has the American cut of the movie. It has Dubbed. several trailers. Yeah. Uh, um, different and, audio options. And the subtitles are. Perf- I mean, they're fan subs essentially, but they're very good. Uh, mm-hmm. Make a. They don't. There's not a lot of typos. They don't. You know. They make a lot of sense. So, very impressive bootleg. <laughs> Three different trailers. Yeah. So. Yeah. Very impressive with the bootleg. But now that, you know, the effects, like I was saying, pretty good for the most part, I think. Uh, Super Ryan and his team did a good job. I think the matting in some shots is a little rough. In some shots, it's rough. Some songs, it looks pretty good. Um, Sometimes the matting's not bad, but like the scene where they're flying the helicopter when they're clearly matted on a background is a little rough. But it's nothing that you haven't seen, like when people are obviously matted into cars that aren't Mm -hmm. actually going down a road. Yeah, I mean. Uh, It's about the equivalent of that, which I I mean, I'm not going to really complain about. There is. A couple shots, I think, what is it, uh, Kira Kubo, mm-hmm. right, the older guy? No, that's not the older that's guy. That's not him, what's his name? Yeah. Which one, what older guy are you talking about? The old guy. The old guy. The old, the old man from Godzilla. Oh, Takashi Shimura. Is that him? The really old guy? Yeah. The really, really old one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, him. And some other guys. They're like, walking around on what's clearly a set. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think, what is it, the, the giant walrus is in front of them or something? They went to go investigate the giant walrus yeah. that was buried, yeah. Yeah, and, like, when they're getting back on their, their little plane or whatever, one of them, like, literally, like, mm-hmm. becomes transparent <laughs> with the monster. Yeah, well, that is. Like, Oops. Oops, yeah. But, Oops. you know, I think a lot of the, like, matte paintings and, and the sets that they built for this for them to walk around on are pretty impressive. Yeah. But no, I mean, like I said, I think for the most part, I mean, it's an early 60s movie. I don't think you'd find much better in an American movie of the same time no, period. No. For, for the most part, the effects aren't aren't horrible. Yeah. So Just I a mean, couple little rough things here and yeah. there. I, th- I was pretty impressed, actually. Score? It works. It, it, it works. works. It, if, you, if I hadn't have saw the, the uh, crew before I watched this movie, I would have swore it was a Fukube, because at times mm-hmm. it sounds a lot like some of Fukube themes. <laughs> but yep. no, it's... Uh, like the main theme of the movie almost sounds like, almost like a variation of the Godzilla theme. Yeah, it point. does. I'm like, oh. Mm-hmm. But it is by this guy named Ken Ishii, who I think he was channeling his best of Fukube. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's good, you know. I think it matches the movie well. Yeah, it I think works it's, really well with the movie. Yeah, I think it it works. It's got that you know kind of like classic Showa era score f- kind of sound to it. But also like. still a pretty classic like. Even for American, pretty classic, like, spacey, sci-fi, sci-fi movie It's a score. nice blend yeah. of those things, I think. I like it quite a bit. There's some nice uh, pieces of music that get, like, really loud and tense. Yeah. Try- well, trying to be tense. Yeah, try- when, <laughs> when some of the scenes are trying to be tense. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think it works really well, so. Anyway, y'all want to do some final thoughts on this and give it a grade? Shit. Well, Go Andrew. for it, Andrew. You know, yeah. this is not a bad movie, y'all, no. Yeah. The pacing is all right. The models are pretty good the matting and the, all that is passable and you know score the score i like the score it fits well with what's going on in this movie the acting is not the worst mm-hmm. i've seen 
this is this is this is Toho's A list. This is the like <laughs> entire like, A list. This is A yeah. team right here. Yeah. <laughs> entire A team. They yeah, got everybody in for this one. So you know, I'm gonna give this movie like a B. All right, Dylan. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's, it's all right. Yeah, much better than I thought it was gonna be. Yeah, I thought it was gonna be garbage. I will second that it was a pleasant surprise for sure. <laughs> yeah. All in all, I mean, it's not a complete and total bore fest. Mm-hmm. It's entertaining enough for an 88-minute movie of the time. Mm-hmm. It works. The, uh, the, 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 uh, yeah, what, what you <laughs> say? Are you okay over there? I'm broken inside! <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, <laughs> oh god! <laughs> the pace in this film was actually pretty decent. Even you know, like I said earlier, we we sometimes like to complain about long, extended boardroom sequences, or you know, UN meetings, or military meetings, or whatever. It works fairly well in this film. It's not just you know an atrocity. So that's that's helpful. The sci-fi action is fun when it happens. Granted, this plot is ludicrous mm-hmm. about a giant star floating towards the planet and they decide to build rockets <laughs> on the South Pole. And yeah. It's like, let's just take Bikini Bottom and move it over there. Push! <laughs> Push! <laughs> <laughs> How do we always get back to Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. SpongeBob reference. But uh, yeah, it's it's something I, did, I could have done without the giant walrus. It's pretty pointless. I mean, he, it looks like a giant rubber walrus suit with a guy in it. So. Sounds like a Shiro Honda could have done without it too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it would be the same movie with or without, so it doesn't really matter. But would we be reviewing it without the walrus? I mean, probably. probably would, yes. Probably. probably just because it's an Ashiro Honda movie. We've yeah. watched other yeah. movies that are not technically giant monster movies either. This so. is true. Yes. Uh, just because it's an Ashiro Honda film. And I think we're going to watch other movies that are made by Ashiro Honda that are not technically giant monster movies either. This is true. Yes. <laughs> so, the effects in this movie are, all in all, they're pretty decent. They're definitely of their time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they are not anything better or worse, per se, than anything else we've seen in a in a classic Showa era or, you know, uh, Showa era Godzilla film or just Showa era Toho production of any sort. So there's a couple rough matting shots and I hate the little plastic people on some of the models even though mm. sometimes they're needed for certain certain little vehicles. But for the most part, the effects are pretty good and I actually really like the score for this movie. I'll, I'll give it a... God, oh, B or B. I'll, I'll give I'll give it a B. I'll be nice. All right. Yeah, I, I'll agree. You know, coming into this movie, I you know I think it's you know at least over here in America one of the lesser known Toho movies, and you know we've watched some other ones like Atragon and uh, I think I gave that one an F. <laughs> I think. And, and other ones similar to that that we just started was very boring. But this one, I was actually pretty entertained the whole, the for most part, the, the uh, most of the 90 minute runtime. I think Super Eyes team did a lot of really great effects work in this movie. I really <laughs> love, you know, this is one of those, if you want to think about like classic, you know, 50, 60 era sci-fi movies, this movie hits a lot of those tropes, which I think is a good thing because I enjoy stuff like that. Only um, they were missing is an alien. Right. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, there's a giant walrus. Does that count? <laughs> mm. I love some of the ludicrous nature of it. Like you said, building giant rocket engines into the South Pole to move the Earth 400,000 kilometers to move it out of the way of an incoming giant star that's, you know, hurtling at it at quick speeds. <laughs> Coming into it, you know, I was worried that it would just kind of be like literally just the Japanese version of when worlds collide, just basically, you know, with Japanese actors instead of American actors. But no, I was. I think they did a pretty good job differentiating this from that from that movie. I mean, I'm gonna say it was probably inspired by that plot, but but I think they did a good job of making it a different movie. Um, I think the acting is again. This is like in Toho's entire A list team on this movie. There's a lot of recognizable faces in this movie, um, and I think they all do a great job in the roles that they're given. I mean, yeah, characters aren't very deep in this movie. There's a lot of them, and. None of them have really fleshed out stories, but you know, for their little bit parts, they they play their role really well. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I think I'm going to give it a B, just like you guys. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised. I was, I was. It was not intent. the garbage I thought it was going to be. Yeah, no. It was definitely not garbage. This is this is a pretty good 
Toho sci-fi. I'm you know. just gonna say I have to assume that Michael Bay probably watched When Worlds Collide. Yeah, and maybe this. Maybe this. You take the giant monster out of this, and yeah. instead of m- moving Bikini Bottom, yeah, you just send some pretty people up into space to blow up a, yeah. uh, the asteroid. You yeah. know. Mm-hmm. And you got Armageddon. Yeah, I will say yeah. this one is much more similar to Armageddon. Like, when worlds collide, from the onset, they decide the Earth is not savable. So, they, instead of, you know, trying to save Earth, because they have, you know, two celestial bodies. They have the main one and then, like, the moon of the other planet coming at them. And uh, the main one passes Earth by and does about the same damage that Goroth does in this movie. What destroys Earth is the moon that's orbiting the other body comes around and slams into earth and destroys it but anyway they know early on that 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 the that, that earth isn't salvageable so most of that movie is spent as the characters are in you know their little camp base where they're building the rocket ship that's going to take you know just this handful of humans to to the new planet as it passes by and they're going to live there from now on and you know the most of the movie is spent them building the ship and the tensions rising as you know it gets closer and everyone realizes that only a few of them are going to be able to survive and then it gets to the end. There's some destruction. And really, it's like the last five minutes of the movie. They get on the rocket ship. They fly over to the other planet. And they <clears> walk <throat> off the spaceship and, you know, live happily ever after, I guess. So, yeah. This one, I think, is much more similar to Armageddon. Which yeah. They- you, you take out the <laughs> giant walrus. You you give it a $100, $150 million budget in the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. You put a bunch of Americana and explosions. You put a bunch of pretty people in it. Uh, you get Aerosmith to do the music, and you got Armageddon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> essentially. Basically. But anyway, not much news to talk about this week. There was a new poster for Godzilla Singular Point that showed Godzilla, and you know they had shown the design earlier, but this this poster, like, I don't know, Godzilla looks a little weird. Like his jaw is like unhinged or something. Yeah, it looks, yeah. looks kind of weird. It's um, like tusk. Yeah, it looks interesting. I'm definitely interested to see how that goes. Um, and also, it's been revealed that Godzilla vs. Kong will take place five years after King of the Monsters. Millie Bobby Brown hasn't aged that much. That's what I was thinking, too. Yeah, she has not aged five Which years. To, what, how old is she supposed to be in that movie? I don't know. In that last movie. She's not old enough to drive. Yeah. I think it's what, she's supposed to be like 14 or 15 in that yeah, movie? Yeah, something like that. So, I mean, let's assume she's 14. That puts her at, supposed to be 19 now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is... Like Millie Bobby Brown's actual age, I guess. Right about. She's like... She's 17. She's 17, so yeah. closer to her actual age. Yeah. But this was filmed like, <clears throat> what, two years ago? Almost, this movie's filmed almost two years ago, probably yeah. now. <laughs> um, Most of it, at least. But, I mean, logic is not going to be concerned with this movie. Dylan, no, what are we talking about? No, there's going to be no logic in this movie. <laughs> it took them a long time to figure out all, all the science uh, behind how to use that that Ghidra head to turn it into Mechagodzilla. Yeah, there you go. Well, anyway, um, I don't know if that's a spoiler or not. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you—it's the worst kept secret in Hollywood. If you can't, fi- no, the worst kept secret in Hollywood is the fact that Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are going to be in Spider-Man Three. Well, that's another worst kept secret. But, but I mean, if you can't catch the little the little shots of Mega Godzilla and the Godzilla vs. Kong yeah. trail, you must be blind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, they've already like basically released. I, I saw where images the, of uh, toys. Yeah, they 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 released some images of toys by or they got leaked. Really some images yeah. of toys, some images of the Funko Pops yeah. that are coming out, and which I haven't actually looked at them to see what Mega Godzilla is supposed to look like. But it's not real definitive. <laughs> I did see some of the toys at Walmart the other day for Godzilla vs Kong that they had released, and there's like mm-hmm. one of Kong where he's like got a whole chunk of his shoulder missing that you can take Damn. off and put back on. So mm. it might it might get rough. It might get brutal. And he yeah. also he also has his battle axe. He comes with his battle axe. Battle axe. <laughs> it's Godzilla's like spine. This is a battle axe. Lord Jesus. It can deflect his ray. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah. anyway. this movie's gonna be ridiculous. I am very excited about our movie next week. It is Gamera Trash. Revenge of Iris, Sorry, one of I'm my kidding. favorite monster movies ever made, legitimately. So I'm really excited to be revisiting that one. Coming up after that, of course, we're going to be coming up. What are we reviewing after that? I don't know. Pull up the schedule. So after Revenge of Virus, we're going to watch The X from Outer Space. Then we're going to watch Gamera the Brave, another really good film in my opinion. And then an episode that will come out a little late uh, because of when it's being released, Godzilla vs. Kong. That's right. It comes out that Wednesday. We'll try to have that episode out to you by that Friday. And then we'll kick off our, our King Kong retrospective with the original and then we'll go back to the monster x strikes back which is 
kind of it's not really a sequel to the X from Outer Space. It's kind of a parody film that just kind of uses the monster from that first movie. <laughs> and then we'll start flip, flopping between uh, Kong movies and uh, just other giant ape films. Yeah. Such as the Mighty Joe Young films. Rampage. Rampo. Yeah. And then uh, toward the end of the Kong retrospective, looks like we got like some Clash of the Titans movies, mm-hmm. including the remake and its sequel. Mm-hmm. And then uh, yeah, toward the end of the year, looks like starting in July, we will start Tremors. That's yay, right. Yay. Tremors. Are you excited? Kevin Bacon. Kevin, well, that's yeah. only one of them. Only one. Yeah. And Reba. 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 That's true. She's in that one, too. And other people. Yes. Fred Ward. <laughs> oh. Anyway, uh, that's that's anyway. still a ways down the road. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, so Revenge of Virus next week. That's a great one. If you haven't checked it out, I definitely suggest that you watch it. It's a great movie. As far as our other podcast goes, we're uh, we're watching Conjuring movies. Yeah, right now we are. Uh, uh, we should have Annabelle. Will be our Annabelle last should have been our yeah, yeah our most recent episode. And the next episode we will be doing will be The Conjuring 2, Mm -hmm. followed by, I believe, Annabelle Creation. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to review Wrong Turns reboot Mm -hmm. thingy, but Amazon is stupid. Yeah. And the pre-order is stupid. (laughs) And it's not doing like it usually does, where it usually gets to you, you know, like day of release. So it's, I guess, back ordered. So it could end up being here. By the end of March. We hope to conclude that yeah. series in the first week of April. So, um, mostly just Conjuring movies right now. Yeah. So, uh, keep a lookout for that. It's Movies Don't Create Psychos. Should be available on uh, most of the major podcasting services. That's right. Yep. But other than that, if you want to contact us concerning this podcast, you can contact us at stompthisway1954 at gmail.com. This is true. If you want to follow us on our social medias, we're up on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We're at Stomp This Way on all those platforms. Make sure you give us a like or follow. Be sure to tell your friends about us. That's right. We also have a website. Andrew, where can they find that website? They can find that website at www.stompthisway.podbean.com. That's right. Dylan, is there anything worthwhile over there? Probably not. No, not at all. No. Nope. <laughs> over there, you can see our full schedule of events, which we just had to look at ourselves so we know what we were watching next mm-hmm. week and the week after. Mm-hmm. You can also look at that on our website. That's right. As well as grades for previous films listed right. on that schedule and backlogged episodes and whatever news air wants to keep you updated. That's right. But anyway, I think that's all we got for you this week. As always, I'm Aaron. I'm Andrew. And I'm Dylan. And we'll catch you in the next one. Mm-hmm.